Good afternoon, everybody. Just a few moments until we begin our session this afternoon, session number two from the Retail Bulletin. Good afternoon. Let's go. Hello, everybody. Let's take that slide down and see everybody's faces. Hello. Um, how are we all doing? If, if you've just joined us again, uh, it's webinar number two, but it's our third session of the day. So um, welcome back. If you stuck with us again, uh, thank you for coming back. If you've just joined us this afternoon, you're just as welcome as well. This is webinar session number two, digital e-commerce transformation. That transformation word gets used an awful lot. Um, but this is really about building engaging experiences online. And I've got a stellar lineup of panelists to kind of bring that to life for you. I'm Darren. I'm the moderator for today. I'm the MD of Williams Harding Consulting and also the chair of men's skincare brand Scrubbed. And I do a bit of this stuff. So moderating uh, webinars and the Retail Bulletin keep inviting me back. So thank you to them for hiring me as well. Um, before I get asked, I was asked on the last panel, no, Scamp's not here today. Scamp is my lovely dog. She's on a play day over in Chelsea, but she will be here for the four o'clock webinar. Um, so if you're a fan of Scamp and you've only come to see her and not me or any of the others, actually, um, tune back in at four o'clock and Scamp will make a little appearance then. Um, we do want you to be involved. We've had some brilliant engagement on the first two sessions today. Uh, so whichever device you're using at the top or the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button. Use it. It's there for you to have a voice. We love it when the audience gets involved. Um, please uh, direct your questions to a panelist. You may have a direct question you want to ask someone specifically. You may have a general question. My job as the moderator is to make sure that every single question gets answered. And I pride myself on clearing all questions before we end today's webinar. So if you ask one, we will answer it. How's that for a commitment for you? So without further ado, I'm going to ask the panel to say hello to you, introduce themselves and to say who they are and where they're from. So let's have a good session. Uh, Paul, if we can start with you, please. Who are you? Tell us a bit about yourself. Great. Um, yeah, so I'm Paul Rogers. Um, I run a company called Vivant, which is a London based e-commerce consultancy and performance marketing agency. Uh, we do a lot of consultancy for luxury and premium brands around replatforming technology and customer experience. Um, I've been working with Clavey for about five years now, so as an advisor or consultant or evangelist, depending on who you talk to. Um, and I work around their roadmap most. So I used to do a lot more with some of their kind of bigger merchants, but now it's more kind of advice and roadmap. Well, welcome. And can I just say also a special thank you to Clevu for their sponsorship and support of the webinar this afternoon as well. It's always appreciated. Thank you for that. Um, welcome. Uh, Diego, tell us about you. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm Diego Fria. I'm an e-commerce director at Totem, uh, a fashion house headquarter in Stockholm. And uh, yeah, I'm originally from Buenos Aires and happy to be here. And you're in Sweden. I'm in Sweden, yeah, I'm in Stockholm uh, today. I'm home uh, doing my thing. <laughs> Excellent, and how's the weather in Sweden today? Is it as good it's as good, it is here been, in the UK? It's been, it's, been, it's been good, actually. It's been sunny, it's been warm, uh, springy, quite unusual for Stockholm. So it's quite a, quite a good time to be here. Push some over this way, please, Diego. That would be Yeah, fun. I know, I heard, I heard. Uh, thank you, though. Welcome for joining the panel. Looking forward to talking to you more. Annie Rose, over to you, hello. Hello, uh, yeah, I'm Annie Locker and I head up Ecom for fashion brands Bella Freud and Alexa Chan. Uh, I've been with the group for uh, just over four years now. Uh, we've recently platformed or in the throes of doing both um, platformed from Magento to, to Shopify Plus. Welcome, looking forward to hearing your insights um, on the panel later. And just to prove our global theme today, um, we're going to go over to Dubai to say hello to Nadima, where I'm guessing the weather is absolutely scorching. It is, I won't share that with you. So hi everyone, <laughs> thanks for having me. Um, my name is Nadima, I'm the founder of My Beauty Matches, which is a price comparison and product recommendation website. I launched that about seven, eight years ago. And two years ago, I launched Beauty Matching Engine, which is a personalization solution specifically for beauty companies. So they can offer personalized recommendations to their customers. Um, so yeah, looking forward uh, to discuss more. What I'll also say is uh, normally when I'm in London, 
I also run uh, beauty tech dinners and I advise uh, private equity companies as well, um, looking to invest in beauty. So kind of B2C, B2B and uh, the financial side. Here we go. Good stuff, well welcome. Come on Nadima, just indulge me for a second. What's the temperature today? <laughs> mm. I think it's around 38 degrees. Heaven, absolute heaven. <laughs> actually, actually, it's been really fantastic, but I think from next month, it's going to be too hot. So many people will actually be leaving Dubai because even though when you go in the sea, the water's too warm, it's a bit weird. Mm. I know it sounds weird, but till you experience it, you, you will not know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm a regular visitor. My, well, I was a regular visitor until we were stopped from flying everywhere. But um, my, one of my absolute best, closest friends lives over in Jumeirah Park. And uh, I kid you not, I, I am happily in his garden in its late 40s. And he's kind of looking through the window at me like I'm insane. But he's got a pool, so you can cool down. So there's no such thing as too hot in this world, as far as I'm concerned. Too hot. Thank you for sharing that moment with us. You're welcome. Um, thank you. Uh, Lucy, how are you doing? Welcome to the panel. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm Lucy. I'm a solutions manager at WeMate Websites, which is a Shopify Plus agency. I've been there for about three years. And during that time, I've probably overseen about 40 Shopify rebuilds and reforms. So me and my team are responsible for advising merchants on the technical aspects of replatforming and scaling with Shopify. Brilliant. And you are very welcome to join us today as well. So thank you. Let's kick it off. So don't forget, audience, please do use your Q&A, uh, get involved, and uh, please be part of our webinar. Paul, um, no pressure. I'm going to kick off with you, if that's OK. Um, you guys advise a lot of retailers on you know, replatforming. But what's your takeaway on luxury and experience? Does opinion often win over data? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I feel like it's probably the biggest vertical where opinion often wins over there. Well, it's not necessarily opinion. Um, I guess it's more brand and creative stakeholders winning over maybe best practice or yeah, where kind of data can be used to back something up. Um, I tend to kind of sit in the middle um, and put a lot of cases forward for kind of UX usability. Um, but I would say working with luxury brands, um, brand has a pretty, and I, would, I wouldn't necessarily say this for replatforming actually, it's more for redesigns. And if that's happened as part of a replatforming, um, then that as well. But yeah, I, I'd say there's usually uh, a big focus on brand. Um, there's certain areas I think that are kind of more obvious, um, but usually brand has a pretty significant impact on the kind of designs and art direction and creative direction. Um, accessibility and performance are two areas that I usually uh, kind of govern, I guess, and try to um, uh, kind of ensure a factored into decisions. Um, same with kind of mobile usability and stuff like that. But I think uh, historically I used to be like a real kind of like guardian for econ best practice and like always used to push those kind of UX areas. Uh, but now I think I sit more in the middle because I think they're probably, it probably is important in luxury to have a bit of a balance and ensure that you, you know, you've got like a really engaging kind of unique brand experience, I guess, and everything's in line with your brand guidelines and everything else. Um, but I think it's a harder role to be an econ consultant sometimes in those projects and, um, yeah, and kind of govern those decisions. But um, equally, I think it's just it's just a hard area. So you've sort of you sort of experienced a personal mindset shift as well, then, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be honest, it's just usually that the stakeholders in the project. Uh, a lot of their goals are more focused on the kind of brand experience than, you know, the usual kind of uh, conversion metrics, I guess. Um, so obviously that's important and being able to trade the site is important. Um, but equally, brand is usually, a, you know, a big voice in those discussions. Thank you, sir. I'll come back to you again, uh, no doubt. Uh, Diego, I'm going to come over to you in Stockholm, if I may. Tell us about your business. You've recently undergone like a replatforming and digital transformation process. What were the, the challenges and opportunities for that sort of experience online for a luxury brand when you're sort of starting with a fresh slate? Yeah, good question. Uh, we launched early Feb uh, this year. So still in some ways very fresh. In some ways it feels like two years ago. Uh, but, you know, the, the process of, of replatforming um, and sort of the overall project, it is 
sort of uh, it, it takes you know a, a big effort and um, the, the amount of decisions and uh, sort of negotiating that one needs to do. Paul mentioned a few things already when it comes to design and, and sort of the profile of the brand. How, how do we translate sort of the philosophy right, of the brand uh, into a functional site? So there's sort of a big tech aspect that uh, you need to sort of immerse in. And there's also sort of the kind of the softer side, right? There's just the brand and, and, and design side of things. And you, you sort of, I'm sort of in the middle trying to, uh, with the team, marry both. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a very, it's been a very interesting project, very demanding, I would say. Uh, but also, as uh, Totem as a brand, we, you know, we we are a brand that uh, that doesn't compromise, and I'm sure uh, the people that we work with could could attest to that. Um, and so you're trying to, you know, I'm trying to launch. We're trying to launch a site, uh, but also without compromise, and trying to find the balance between these two things. It's always an inter interesting challenge. Thanks for the share on that. I mean, it's it's funny when you said it feels like it's been three years. Does it feel like you've just you've just done so much? There's been so much work to do that it just time almost becomes a uh, irrelevant because there's just so much to get through. It feels like forever when it's only been a few months. You know, yeah, exactly. And it's something that you know, uh, as you do the replatforming, uh, sort of as you go through the project, you know, as you get closer to launch, then it gets more intense, and it it really kind of takes over your <laughs> your days or your life um, <laughs> so i really admire people that do this very often for work. usually something that you know from the brand side you would do it maybe once every three years tops but uh yeah so uh, i admire uh, um, peers that do this often for a living <laughs> good well thank you for the share sir and um congrats on the work done so far yes uh, annie i'm going to come to you customer experience luxury they kind of go hand in hand right um how do brands as lux as yours to recreate that experience online? Yeah, well, I think it's important to remember that you're not just selling a product with luxury or selling an aesthetic. People are buying into a lifestyle. Uh, I think we've seen e-com surge so much over the last year. Uh, and with the closure of retail, it's meant that brands' online presence has to be so much more important. And it is uh, more affordable and easier to do so. So you've got quite a saturated market. So it's making sure that it's not just a simple transaction, but it's more experiential. So with both brands, we're looking at doing a lot of brand discovery, um, making sure that there's lots of elements that people can read about. Uh, also making sure that there's no dead ends. So every web page has got somewhere that leads on to something else, allowing the customer to, to carry on their journey. And we're also implementing some category pages that sit sort of content and product, bridging that gap between maybe your home page and your listing pages. Um, I think also it's important to think that like the online session for luxury is such a small part of it. The customer journey is actually, there's so many different touch points. So you've got obviously your delivery, your packaging, and then even if your customer is returning something, that has to be a positive because that's the last thing you want to leave with that customer to be in their head. Um, yeah, we're looking at lots of different ways of doing it. We're also looking at a few ideas that are maybe more synonymous with high street brands like loyalty schemes and UGC and reviews and not so much in a kind of point-based system for a loyalty scheme like a Nectar card, but a maybe more um, unlocking aspects of the brand the more they engage with you. Um, so we're kind of really getting them to buy into this lifestyle. And have you seen uh, your online experience shift in a positive direction because of the pandemic or in spite of were you already in a good place before yeah i think i think people are spending maybe more time because there is no they can't go to the shops or whatever so we've seen engagement increase um but i think also because of that we spend so much time on the on our phones on uh devices so we expect newness constantly so it's being able to provide that and giving more exploration Thank you for the share on that as well. It's um, it's been interesting to hear that, you know, so many retailers we, we I've spoken to certainly in my client work and uh, just weren't ready for the the seismic shift that happened online and they were a lot playing lots of catch up. But it sounds like you've just been deepening and richening the experience rather than having to chase your tail and suddenly panic to catch up due to the global pandemic. So, good work. 
um, Nadima, that's come over to the UAE. Those 30 odd degrees. I'm not thinking about it at all, I promise. Reading um, quick and open arms. <laughs> <Just come. laughs> I'd love to come. What personalizations have you seen um, online and offline in your world in beauty retail? Um, well, personalization trend in beauty started quite a while back. Um, I believe kind of my beauty matches kind of started a big part of that trend seven, eight years ago. But it's also beauty is a lot more personal, like you actually put it on your skin and hair. So it's a very, very um, personal category. So because of that, personalization is very important. So what we've seen online, um, sorry, offline, let me start with that first, is there's uh, individual products being made. So there's a company called Function of Beauty. They allow you to... Um, create a shampoo which is just for you so kind of nearly like a dating app they allow you to answer questions about your hair type etc etc and then you kind of formulate your own shampoo and there's also that being done also uh, for skincare with Curology but then there's also a lot of personalization happening offline using devices so Philips uh, you know the electronics brand actually launched a hair dryer that when you bring it close to your hair um, it can sense how much moisture, et cetera, you have in your hair, what heat it should be on, what speed it should be on. So there's also a lot of devices like that and also skin diagnostics. Like it's a device you'll put on your skin and it can measure like, you know, what your skin needs, et cetera. So that's kind of what's been happening on the personalization front offline. Um, online, there's still a lot to happen. I think first it kind of started off with augmented reality a lot. Um, which is kind of like virtually trying on makeup or virtually trying on hair colors, et cetera. That has been really great for engagement, but it hasn't really proven a lot of ROI, which is why you can see some companies, um, they're not replicating it across their brand portfolio. Um, and then there's also a lot of personalization happening itself. So for instance, whether it's My Beauty Matches or some others, they're allowing uh, their customers to take an online quiz where they answer information about themselves so they can instantly be recommended products which obviously given COVID and lots of store closures or the lockdown has been quite imperative um, there's still a lot that needs to be done on that side because um, these answers or questions are quite static most of them so uh, for instance it's like when you go you know, on ASOS or a website, there's a filter and it just kind of filters down the big catalog into a few products. But true personalization is one-to-one -one personalization. So obviously you're a guy, I'm a girl. So the products that we recommended to each other would be different and also based on climate. So if I'm living in a warmer climate, I'm going to need different kinds of products. So we have seen, for instance, on My Beauty Matches, we don't do that as such but some of the clients are using Beauty Matching Engine, for instance, are using a software which allows them to better personalize all the product recommendations, um, emails, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. It does indeed, thank you for that. Um, and, uh, what about you You personally at, uh, at Beauty Matters, at my, my Beauty Matches, sorry. Um, have you had to, dramatically pivot your plan because of the pandemic or have you, have you stayed in a fairly steady course? So um, we have actually done quite well uh, given that it was already an online digital business and My Beauty Matches is also a price comparison website so you don't want to go to multiple stores so obviously it kind of helped us out and then in the how to spend it section at BFT which is a, you know for about luxury uh, giving advice for luxury consumers, uh, My Beauty Matches was mentioned as one of the top place, one of the top five places to buy beauty products online during COVID. So, well you know, us, it ended up being quite good, but we, we yeah. didn't predict that this would happen. It just happened. Sure. You know. But you managed your, you managed that happening as well, which is an important part of the process too. So, thank you for the share, uh, Lucy. Thank you for being so patient um coming to you now uh, you work with lots of different retailers lots of different projects and so on is there anything trending in customer experience that you'd like to share yeah definitely so 
I think that as we're coming out of lockdown, there's this real focus on retention of customers that you're able to recruit whilst everyone was sitting at home and the only thing to look at and look forward to was getting things in the post. People were shopping online a lot more. But while it's going back to normal, people are looking at any opportunity to go, okay, need to cancel that now, need to stop that, I'm not going to you know, re revisit that brand because I'm spending my money on restaurants and going out and going on holiday again. So one thing I've seen a lot of recently is that um, people who have really successful subscription businesses are now focusing not on selling more products, but making the account areas of those subscription um, businesses really, really easy to use. So the absolute goal is to make sure that you can give the customer like as much of an opportunity to like skip, pause, change, swap, so that they just don't end up canceling. So there are some really great products out there at the moment that you know you can trigger text messages or WhatsApps to um, your customers to say, oh, you've got a shipment coming in two days time. Do you want to skip it, cancel it, pause it, whatever? And it just means that then you're not getting that churn that everyone is trying to avoid with the subscriptions business. But I appreciate that's very specific to you know subscriptions. Um, so another thing that I really love at the moment that I'm seeing more and more people do is um, kind of these sort of creative loyalty schemes that aren't just, you know, as Annie said, not, you know, the points mean prizes kind of approach, but really backing your product and your brand and getting people to come back. Um, so um, people are a lot more focused on like altruism and giving back. And um, so what I've seen um, a lot of is people wanting to sell like refills of things. So I buy the beauty product and I get the whole, you know, packaging straight away on my first shipment. And then I can actually send the jar back and get it refilled. So you're kind of, you know, um, allowing people to make a kind of slightly more like eco-friendly choice. And we know that especially with like Gen Z consumers, they only want to go for brands that they feel like are looking after the planet and are kind of, um, you know, uh, slightly more kind of eco-minded. Um, and then fashion brands are also getting into this too. So they have kind of the ability of um, uh, creating these returns flows where if you've got a piece of clothing that's got a tear or a rip or it's um, you know, so slightly kind of worn away, you can send it back and they will um, you know, repair it for you. Um, and I just think that, um, again, it's sort of backing your, the quality of your brand and your product by saying, this is so good that you can send it back to us and we'll fix it for you and it will still last you a lot longer instead of pushing the kind of buy, buy, buy thing, which I think puts people off a little bit these days. Yeah, it's like a it's like an extension of a, a, a brand promise, I guess, you know, yeah. that kind of guarantee always. This this giving back, this sustainable mm. uh, community piece has been a real theme that's come out over the course of the sessions we've ran today, actually. I think mm. lots of retailers have really, that really turned their attention to this. Mm. Are, you, are you seeing that, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like most of the brands that um, we're seeing coming out into the D2C space, the new ones that are really exciting, they you don't really see those brands um, like without having some kind of like mindset about giving back or sustainability. Um, you know, whether it's paint, makeup, underwear, whatever, it's all just very much, um, you know, you, people have like pages and information about what they're doing to, you know, be carbon neutral, et cetera. Thanks, Lucy. It's really interesting. As I said, it's, bit, it's mirroring some of the insight that we've heard earlier. So definitely some themes emerging there. Uh, Paul, coming back to you. And by the way, actually, our audience number panel is um, staying steady. Our audience number has gone up slightly since we started the webinar. So well done. Good work. Uh, so you're not losing people. So well done indeed. Of course, if we did lose people, it'd be entirely the panel's fault. Nothing to do with the moderator whatsoever. Um, but no, that's brilliant. So thanks for sticking with us, audience. We still love some questions though, so no one's used the Q&A button yet. So it's there, ready for you to use, um, but we'll keep going around the panelists. So uh, if you've got a burning question, um, I'm here to make sure it's asked. Paul, back to you, sir, if I may. Um, going back to the best possible experience online, what tools do you often recommend to retailers? Yeah, um, so I guess it varies massively, depending, like we mostly work with brands um, and of different levels. So dependent on, yeah, their team, like, yeah, the volumes they're doing, everything else, it does vary. Um, search is one that I've written down here that I think is an obvious one. Um, and obviously I consult for Clayvu, but I'm a big advocate of Clayvu as a product. And I think um, people need to be able to kind of merchandise the search results. They need a certain level of automation. There's and a level, there's a kind of expectation um, from consumers, you know, that 
um, brands or retailers should have a working search function. Um, so I think that's an obvious one. I've got returns, uh, some of the kind of newer uh, CX platforms as well. I've been working with a bit recently. So like the Narvas or the Afterships or Malomos. Um, CRM um, continues to be a massive focus for brands. I feel like that's uh, become as kind of like what Lucy was saying, I feel like a lot of brands have started to really obsess over retention of CRM and a lot of the people we work with now have CRM managers or CRM teams that maybe didn't before. Um, and then on top of some of those other ones, different levels of personalization, um, potentially a DXP level or more like just a, you know, across product recommendations and content, stuff like that. Um, you know, headless is a big thing at the minute for brands, so different uh, kind of front end stacks and different solutions as part of that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, a couple more just like shipping, really. Um, any all What's headless, that. sorry, Paul? Uh, so essentially headless um, at a high level is kind of separating out your front end and back end technology stack. Um, and there's kind of a few benefits around flexibility and freedom and potentially performance. But there's a lot of uh, considerations around, that, I guess, pros and cons. Uh, I won't talk about that too much because I'm sure we could all talk about that for the rest of the afternoon. Um, but yeah, so that, that's quite a big one at the moment. And then, yeah, logistics, shipping, like all of that side, all the comms around it. Um, yeah, it just feels like everyone's looking at lots of different third parties at the moment. Um, you know, there's a lot of great technology coming out. Um, I've got, I mentioned Hero here as well. I've got about 12 clients that have done Hero recently because of everything that's going on with the pandemic. Um, yeah, and I think, I think it's really nice. I think it's a good time to be a brand because there's just so much new technology and like so much competition that's kind of driving people forward across all of these different areas. It sounds like you've got so much content in there to talk about that you should probably speak to Karen at the Retail Bulletin and organise a whole new clay who sponsored session around that. I think, um, yeah, I think everyone in this panel could probably do that as well. Um, <laughs> I know, yeah, well, I've worked with all, Lucy, Annie, and Diego on a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah, and I think most brands are kind of, you know, looking at pushing the barriers at the moment, like so much attention on digital. Um, so, yeah. I feel another session coming on if you're listening, Retail Bulletin. Okay, good, good work. Thank you, Paul. Um, coming to you, uh, you Diego, um, back to the luxury world. And uh, a slight segue out, but how important is merchandising in a luxury experience? Yeah, for us, it's very important. Uh, Totem revolves around the idea of a, of a modern uniform. So curation is a big part of, of what we do, right? So it's always very, you know, finding the balance between uh, sort of curating the experience. Uh, you know, Nidima and Annie Rose, they talked about um, personalization uh, and sort of one-to-one -one care, which is something that we're also working uh, to towards. Um, but yeah, and, and also finding a way to uh, automate it, right, and create uh, a little bit more uh, sort of to, to, be, to make it scalable, that's really important as well. So finding that balance is always difficult, but for us, it's everything. I mean, we, we really curate almost uh, actually every corner of the site, and we stay quite hawkish about it. And we, you know, we, we really put a lot of uh, attention and love uh, 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 sort of into curation and merchandising and sort of presenting a, a very strong point of view. We, we really aim to create uh, sort of a totem universe, right? And, and part of that is uh, merchandising, not only on, on our Shopify channel, but across, you know, we have Tmall and, and uh, of course, offline as well. Curate's an interesting word because it's that real getting down to the level of detail that you want to achieve, right? I mean, creating is one thing important. Curating is a whole new level, I think, where you really get down to the fine art of what you're trying to say. Well, yeah, totally. And and if anything, the site is a sort of uh, the pipes, right? You, you're able to um, uh, sort of portray your point of view. But for us... Um, the work that we do day to day on the site is really important. How, uh, you know, uh, even to the level of product recommendations, we do it uh, manually, but that's because we really want to have to be able to sort of control the experience and make sure that every look, every product is, is sort of chosen uh, for a specific reason and that it really uh, goes hand, you know, hand in hand with what we want to offer to, to, to 10 uh, fans and clients. Customers. Thank you, sir. Uh, Annie, I'm going to come back to you, if I may. Um, DTC for Bella Freud and Alexa Chung, how does that direct relationship with your audience help you? 
But I think the importance of D2C has become a lot more prevalent over the last few years and even more so over the last year because we can't and we don't want to be so reliant on our wholesale side of the business. I think that having that direct relationship with your customer, you're not diluting your brand voice through a third party or a, a, a kind of multi-brand online retailer. Um, so you can literally have that relationship with your customer. So you're bringing them to your site with online exclusives. You can be a lot more reactive, you can test. Um, also it's better margin. So uh, it's giving them a reason to, to be part of your database. And obviously as um, Paul mentioned that our kind of CRM is so important um, and we can really engage with them, learn from them, build out lookalike audiences and so forth. Therefore you're kind of, it's a lot more accurate with what you're doing. And obviously we know that a brand that knows their customer is, is going to be much more successful. So those channels yeah, are rich in not just commercial uh, activity for you, but how you can identify your customer behavior as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And by segmenting and targeting what different people are doing, it's customer behavior, not just bringing in revenue. It's how we'll learn and improve and, and grow. Good work. Thank you so much. I can see some questions are coming in and I'm going to come back to them shortly, but thank you audience for a, uh, beginning to uh, engage. I will get those to the panel shortly. Nadima, I'm going to come to you again, if I may. Um, AI, it gets talked about a lot. And I think, you know, even just the acronym of AI scares people a bit. I don't think I fully understand what AI means in certain contexts. Um, everyone claims to be doing it. Um, but what AI successes and results have you seen? Yeah, um, so... Within AI, I think the first thing is like to break it down what, you know, how to maybe think about AI as well, which can make you make it less scary. We actually all consume AI without knowing it on a daily basis. So for instance, when we were all watching Netflix, um, you know, the more you watch it, the more it learns what to recommend to you. Or when you're listening to music on Spotify, it can understand better what other music suggestions to make for you. So the whole concept about true AI is essentially understanding what um, your customers like so that you can better predict what to recommend to them next. So what we have seen on My Beauty Matches, for instance, um, the quiz we use, like we use a digital beauty assistant technology and we use this beauty specialist technology to do this. So we have seen whether it's us or other companies, um, the average order value within two months uh, goes up 35%. Because it's, if you're a retailer and you have, you know, millions of traffic, billions of permutations, it's just not possible to maintain that on a manual level. And also if you have a beauty quiz, which is static, it's not gonna take into account all the new products which are launching, all the products which are leaving, trends like in beauty there's certain you know ingredients which are trending not just retinol and hyaluronic acid it might also be you know this is a bit from the girly world but you're in beauty right <laughs> but so you've got like products like azaic acid or niacinamide so these products are now trending people want to shop that more so you need to be able to pick up these um uh ingredients as well but what i'll also say is the best way the reason it has worked with that for us very well is generally any retailer looking at working with an AI company, they should think about two things. Uh, the first is, if possible, working with a specialist solution. So let's say if you're selling shoes, there's a company called Shoe Size Me. We are using Beauty Matching Engine. Because what you want to do is you want to not just run AI and you don't want to do it just using, you know, the intelligence in that field. You want to be able to combine both together and that's what's actually going to, you know, offer the best results. There's also lots of uh, fashion specialist solutions as well, specifically designed for fashion as well. So that's been um, generally performing a lot better. So the average order value I shared with you, sales conversion rates can go anything between 50% to 80 something percent you know, from whether you're working with a brand or a retailer, but generally on My Beauty Matches, we have both. We have some retailers on the platform, we have brands on the platform. So depending on their number of SKUs they sell, like the sales conversion rate can differ. 
Um, one other thing I would say also for other retailers who are thinking about using AI, they should think about um, two things. In their meetings early on, they should actually combine or include their technology team in the conversations they're having. Um, because many companies claim to be doing AI and they're not. So, you know, they'll call like, you know, these kind of quizzes that you open up, yeah. and do you sleep? Yes or no. Okay, if you don't sleep, were you watching TV before? You know, it's just kind of like a decision tree and they call that AI. But what retailers truly need is real AI. So the tech team should be involved in the conversations. They should ask for, to see the back end of any solution provider to see, do they have to do that? segmentation or is it using true AI and can automatically segment the different audiences and perform better so that the person in charge of CRM or personalization or digital e-commerce can be free and let the technology you know do the work so I think it's very important to have the tech team involved quite early in um, looking at bringing in technology to be able to offer good results. Thank you. And it's a, a very compelling answer. So thank you. Uh, indeed. Yeah. AI, is it being done or not really? Who knows? Um, Lucy, I'm going to come to you and then we're going to start doing some audience questions. Thank you, audience. But Lucy, you worked obviously alongside Di Diego on his, uh, his website build and Paul as well. You all worked alongside each other. Yep. Um, what part of that website uh, are you most proud of and why? So I think for me, and I'm sure for Paul and for Diego and everyone else involved, the biggest challenge with this project was always going to be getting, well, maintaining the creative flexibility that you kind of traditionally get with a WordPress-based website, because Totem was previously on WooCommerce, which is a WordPress e-commerce platform. Um, so we wanted to, you know, maintain all of that freedom creatively for the brand, but also make the most of the scalability and usability of Shopify, because that's the whole reason that, you know, they decided to re-platform. So I don't know whether people know this or don't know this, but Shopify has a bit of a bad reputation for content management and page building functionality. It's, it's kind of considered a bit um, uh, rigid. Um, and obviously we were aware of this. So um, we you know, had to get to work on, on coming up with a solution that was gonna meet all of Totem's needs. Because as you know, they've got this beautiful like grid format with all of this interactive like content video, it's beautiful. Um, not something that you can do out of the box with Shopify. Um, however, we have these um, very brilliant pioneering developers that we make websites and um, we were actually able to build a kind of bespoke page building tool into their theme. So this isn't a third party app or anything like that. It's, it's something we built into the site. That means that they got literally everything they could do with WooCommerce because we did a sort of side by side comparison, but on Shopify. Um, and that combined with the Klaviyu JavaScript library, which is completely flexible on the front end, um, means that you've got the site you see in front of you, but the amount of freedom that the econ team have to run and manage and change that site is like incomparable. So not only have we sort of changed the way that, um, well, well, it's changed the way that I'm able to talk, to shop, uh, talk about Shopify's perceived limitations to customers, um, and then consequently how people can think about Shopify as a platform. And, you know, we, we did that with Totem, with Vivon as a team. And I, I'm really proud of that because I think it's a game changer in e-commerce and especially for Shopify. Work. And this is a lovely segue now from our, our audience member as well. So, um, Diego, I'm going to come to you. And there's, a, there's praise and a question coming your way all at once. Um, so this is from a TRB guest. So thank you, whoever you are. Um, thank you for the question. They love your website. They love how usable but luxury it is. Uh, so thumbs up. Um, they said it's a great balance between e-commerce best practice and brand. And can they please ask what's next on the cards for you guys in terms of the website? Yeah, thanks for, for the nice comments. Um, a lot of uh, work goes into it uh, day to day. But uh, yeah, in terms of what's coming, uh, we have a little bit of a list or a big list, but the themes, uh, if I was gonna uh, stay high level for us, one of them is performance. So that's actual site speed, right? Um, uh, even though uh, we met, um, we, we had a meeting yesterday with the tech team and, and a potential partner, our site is quite fast, one of the fastest they've seen in Shopify, which is really good to hear coming from uh, someone that works with many, many other uh, merchants. Uh, still, it could be faster. So I'm really keen on looking into that. Um, another area for us is personalization. I know uh, Nidima touched on uh, uh, AI and I, I 
I think it's AI at least, but we want to use uh, personalization and an AI tool to, to be able to, you know, um, sort of continue our curation, but also find ways to, to personalize the experience based on where in the journey you are. Say you come into a category page, maybe you're a new user, what should you see at that, at that point versus somebody that is a loyal customer? So we're still exploring and, and, and playing with this, but definitely this is on the cards and uh, in a roadmap. Another one, of course, is localization. We, we strive to be local and, you know, the Thames customer base is very international from, uh, from uh, Japan, Korea, all the way to the US and pretty much um, everywhere in between. So that presents opportunities, but definitely uh, many, many challenges. So we are working really hard to, to continue our, our localization um, uh, projects. And uh, another one, maybe a bit smaller, is sizing. Um, definitely very important. We, you know, I want to, we want to make sure that you pick the right size, that you feel confident about picking uh, the right size. And it sounds simple enough, but it's very, very, uh, very difficult. So we are working to a very hard to try to crack this one. And another one is uh, just uh, we're also looking into loyalty. Uh, Annie Rose uh, talked about this before as well, but definitely finding sort of new ways to, to recognize loyalty and uh, get closer to our community. Thank you very much for that. Hopefully that answers our uh, audience <laughs> members question about what's coming up next. And nice to get some, some love and praise for the website all at the same time, right? So yes. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Now I'm gonna read this next question out. It's from an anonymous attendee. Uh, so thank you. Uh, anonymous person i'm not sure i fully understand the question so maybe the panel will be able to help me out so uh fingers on buzzers panel for the next question so um what do the panel think that finance providers or psps should be focusing on to best service the needs of retailers and customers of the future paul's light's gone on I was, yeah, I, was gonna, I think Lucy will probably have a good answer for this as well. Um, and I'm sure the other two as well. I have three. So help me out with PSP uh, to start with. Yeah, payment service provider. I think that's what it's Yes, saying. right. Got it. I couldn't get it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, from a retailer perspective, I think it's integrations. Um, you know, there's a lot of PSPs, particularly with, you know, this is quite a Shopify focused panel. I think Shopify wise uh, integrations aren't as kind of important, but, you know, you look at some of the mainstream payment providers and their integrations with Magento or, you know, their API uh, documentation and kind of quality with uh, bespoke platforms. I think that's a massive one for retailers. And then I think in terms of the uh, consumer is probably like from a finance perspective, I think one of the points with consumer finance, uh, just, you know, keeping up with demand for the, um, the kind of like options available these days. I think someone was telling me the other day, uh, paying for is like the optimal uh, option for a customer or something like that, like with the slicing and, you know, having lots of different options and being flexible around terms and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I guess I'm not really an expert in payments, but for me, it would be the integration and support for all the new stuff around SCA and all of that kind of stuff. You were still finger first on buzzer there, Paul. So you win a prize. I wasn't sure if that would make me the first answer or not, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure Liz. No, that's really that's a great answer. And actually, you had another question coming in specifically Ooh. for you, Annie. Actually, uh, so thank you, Joseph, whoever you are. Um, I will put the question to Annie for you. So, question for Annie: With the move to Shopify, um, what instant wins do you hope to see off the bat? Yeah, this is quite a funny one because uh, Paul actually was the one that was persuading me for quite a long time. Uh, we were on Magento 2 with both brands. And um, I think that since Magento, Magento has changed quite a lot over the last few years. It was initially built, I think, for a lot of smaller businesses, but it's scaled up. So as a small brand, it's become really expensive. And uh, like to curate your site and to be really flexible from the brand side, um, you, it's so much dev work, basically, it costs a fortune to maintain and to run. Uh, also, Shopify, sort of everything is in one place. Um, and yeah, you can just be much more flexible from the brand, which has been like amazing for us at Alexa. And yeah, we're launching with Bella next month. Thank you. Thank you to Joseph for the question. Now, this next question is anonymous attendee. Um, and they um, reference the fact that Nadim has mentioned AI and we've talked about AI a bit together. But is anyone else on the panel using AI and what results are you seeing? Finger first on the buzzer. 
Anyone on the panel using AI? No, no, not us at the moment, but uh, we are definitely looking into it. So I am very interested. Uh, um, I guess Clever to our, our search functionality, right, to a good degree uh, uses um, sort of search, uh, search uh, clever matches, uh, smart matches, etc. I don't know the level of uh, sort of AI, but for us, you know, we were able to go from a, a system that was very simple to to not only from the front end fully customizable, but also from the sort of functional functionality side of things, also quite quite flexible and uh, and and smart. So we're seeing some benefits from from uh, sort of using smarter uh, tools, uh, and we want to expand that across as well. Good stuff. We are uh, unbelievably flying through time, so um, we're going to start moving to final questions soon for our panel. So if there are any last minute q a from our audience please do shout now uh, thank you by the way for all of you that ask questions it's always great to see some audience participation and thanks for sticking with us um, in some of the previous sessions myself and some of the other panelists talked about you know retail is a an industry regardless of channel you know online offline shops etc um, it, it's a it's an industry that needs to recover in its entirety you know it's been battered because of the global pandemic and so retailers need to really, you know, look out for each other, support each other, you know, not just be competitors, but, you know, work together to help the overall industry. So in that spirit, if I was to ask each of you what your favorite, you know, or a, an online experience that you would call out as a consumer, as one to really look at and celebrate, what would it be? So this is just for you personally, not making a statement on behalf of your business, just you as a shopper. Uh, what would be an engaging experience online that you you know you enjoy using or you would recommend? Paul, kicking off with you. Well, you've changed it slightly towards the end there, so I was ready to answer with my first one, and then I thought of another one, but I'll stick with the first one. So um, I always tell our clients to, and uh, one of uh, someone I've worked with in the past is messaging me because he's here and he's telling me to say heels, um, and heels is very good, uh, but. Um, patch i would say is my example so i always tell our clients to buy a patch plant just because uh what i mean the website's pretty good i'd say like you know it's a fairly good user experience but it's the point from there where they're exceptional and it's mostly the comms so all the way through the order um you know the second you receive the item it starts to kind of like send um kind of guidance on how you should be uh setting up the plant you know and then there's all the aftercare stuff um yeah it's just really nicely done so that every every touch point um, is perfect. Um, and it's really like, I guess, good, but unintrusive at the same time. Um, so yeah, I always use patch as a good example. So it feels more like you're getting information and, and engagement rather than being annoyed. Yeah, absolutely. And also yeah. I think through their site as well, they've got a lot of good information. It's presented very well. Like, you know, it's quite easy. There's a lot of context that kind of helps you find what you're looking for. Um, yeah, I think it's a really good experience. I bought quite a large plant online recently, and it wasn't from Patch, just to be really clear about that. Um, but I will spare their blushes. But this plant turned up pretty much dead um, and sort of hang it, hanging out of the box. And uh, it took them eight days to get back to my email. And then they said, throw it in the bin and we'll send you another one or throw it in the bin and we'll send you a refund. That was the response. It would have and been so, really embarrassing if that was Patch. And then you said yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. hundred percent was not Patch. Um, and so needless to say, I went for option B and said, I'll just have our money back. Thanks very much. But no, Patch is a really great example. Um, thank you, Paul. Um, Diego, who would you recommend or who do you enjoy shopping with because of the experience? Yeah, good question. I think for me, the most important thing uh, as a customer is service. Uh, I really appreciate companies that go out of the out of their way to, to you know, ensure excellent customer service and customer experience. Uh, so I would I would definitely prioritize uh, that over over anything and everything else. Um, and who do I enjoy enjoy shopping from? Oof, good question. I love smaller brands. Uh, I really like uh, you know very small brands, uh, whether it be I don't know Album in the UK, and and I really you know. I love shopping from these smaller brands where you can connect with you know you can just call them, you can just connect with them quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, I, I just love supporting smaller brands and, and smaller companies. 
they tend to have a more personable service. Mm. Yeah, absolutely understand. And, and people, lots of people have shifted that way, I think, to supporting mm. smaller brands, particularly mm. in the most recent sort of 12 to 18 months. Annie, who would you say? Uh, I think that um, the sort of getting the experience from the brand and whilst we're all stuck at home and we can't go anywhere and we want to kind of get lost and see beautiful content, beautiful imagery, the introduction of video on sites, I think something that you can really sort of, I don't know, it's not just shopping, but it's sort of discovering something. And I think that Chanel's site might be a bit of an obvious one, but it's, you can kind of go down a rabbit hole and wound your way around and you're completely wrapped up in luxury. And not a bad thing to be wrapped up in after all. That's a good recommendation. Nadima, who would you call out? I would probably call out two different ones. I mean, I agree with Annie and what some people said on the panel is more about the complete experience and I feel like I don't actually shop just on the website sometimes discover a lot of my stuff on Instagram actually and then you know um, sometimes I shop online but I would probably say I have two favorites one is a tiny startup called the manicurist um, they're French and I just love how they provide like the shopping experience whether it's on Instagram on their website they have like these non-toxic gel nail polishes and I think the imaging is super strong it's really really good um the, another company is actually don't sell products it's our service is still in beauty is treat well um I think for me more than um the imaging and the branding for me is really about ease of use, which I think is one of the reasons why Amazon is doing very well. It's all about, you know, UX, fewer clicks to purchase, et cetera. And I think Treatwell does a fantastic job with both personalizing the service to the customer, but also making the whole discoverability process, booking, unbooking, et cetera, really super easy, which kind of goes a bit in line with what Lucy was saying before as well, right? Like you want to be able to offer your customers different choices and make it really easy. So those two would be my uh, top two right now. Great recommendations. Thanks, Nadima, so much. Lucy, wrap up these recommendations for us. Sure thing. So I would say that um, Anthropology is the first uh, brand that comes to mind for me. Their in-store experience is amazing. So you're never going to not walk past and go in, you know what I mean? It's just um, they you know, the way they actually dress the store, it feels like you're going into a house. And, and so it's all sort of very well curated as you walk through. And, this, and the online store, it sort of mirrors that but is at the same time doing all of the best practice e-commerce things that we know and love. Um, you know, their email marketing, um, their reviews, the use of reviews and size information and UGC is second to none, I would say. Um, I pretty much like go there before anywhere else to buy anything because it's just so easy to know that something is going to fit, something's going to look like the pictures. Um, and equally they have things like Klarna. So because they do have slightly higher price point items, if you're buying clothes, you can buy them without, you know, parting with the cash straight up, which obviously is a really um, key thing for a lot of people now when they're shopping online. Um, and their stuff is just lovely. So yeah, for me, I think that um, anthropology opening up again is really exciting because um, I can't wait to go back in store. Two great recommendations as well. Thank you so much. We, we actually have had a, just a, a, a last minute question in from Daniel, who says apologies if this has been covered because his connection has been dropping. Um, but um, I'm going to put this to you, Diego, to wrap things up for us, if I may. Uh, uh, Daniel's talking about what efforts are being made to improve data collection, you know, storage and analytics that ultimately support the online experience or personalization. Yeah, good question. Overall for us, uh, sort of data collection from all the channels across uh, the company, uh, it's really important for us. Big, big challenge when you have so many uh, channels and a replatforming project and, and new projects coming along. Uh, so we, you know, we look into, uh, we have a data warehouse uh, system that allows us to collect the data and sort and filter it. Uh, that, so that's, that's the way we solve it, right? We just try to we sort of centralize the data into a system. We, we pull it from all the different channels and then we, we use, uh, we use the, the system to review, sort, analyze and share data and et cetera. Um, sort of on-site specifically, um, yeah, for us personalization is still uh, sort of a new, a new area. So, We'll be looking into that, into working with a with a partner that would allow us to to deliver this in a very efficient way, because uh, efficiency is really really important for us. But yeah, I mean something to really think about um, overall, not just within the ecom channel, but across all channels. Find a, a clever way to to get the data right. Thank you.
Mm. Perfect ending. Thank you, Paul, Diego, Annie, Nadima and Lucy. You've been a stellar panel. That is almost an hour that has literally flown by. Our audience has stuck with us for the whole way as well. So thank you so much for that. Thank you to the people that also fielded questions. Um, if you want to come and hang out with the Retail Bulletin again, uh, we're back at four o'clock, taking a little bit of a break now for a couple of hours. Um, augmented reality at four o'clock today. And as I said, Scamp will be making an appearance. So even if you don't come for the augmented reality, come and see the dog at least. But um, for now, massive thank you again to Clayview as our sponsors for this one. Um, thanks to the brilliant panelists and uh, have a brilliant afternoon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks guys, bye. Bye-bye.